Good morning, and welcome to the Saturday Morning Breakfast Bible Study with Pastor Lydia Evelyn Spragan of the New Destiny Christian Methodist Episcopal Church located at 825 Lorenz Avenue in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, 15220. Uh, first of all, before I begin, uh, let me thank all of you who prayed for me and lifted me up on last week when I had to cancel the Bible study um, because I was not feeling uh, well. In fact, my throat was raw and I could not talk. But as you can hear this morning, God has worked a miracle and we are able to give voice to this Bible study lesson. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you so much for what you have done for us, and not only for me, but for everyone listening to the sound of my voice. You woke us up this morning, you clothed us, placed us in our right minds, and gave us a desire to get into your word. Now, Father, send your Holy Spirit that he might teach us what we should know. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you're just joining us, we are in the um, new annual conference, and I have been reappointed, reappointed uh, to the New Destiny CME Church. I am happy to be here for another year and I pray that those of you who are in the Pittsburgh area will drop by and visit us on occasion. We have Sunday school on uh, at 10 o'clock. We have uh, the morning worship service begins at 11. Now let's get into our word. We have been looking at the book of Ruth in the Old Testament, and we have covered it somewhat in depth. Now we are covering it by using the Cultural Background Study Bible, uh, which brings to life the ancient world of Scripture. And we are using the New International Version. Now today, where we are is on uh, page 450, if you have the Bible in front of you. And if you don't, don't worry about it. I will give you enough content and references so you do not have to uh, purchase the Bible. And as usual, you can go to the library and check it out. Um, first of all, let me say that I won't be able to really scratch the surface today of what you can learn from a Bible map. Um, so I have put in the post um, previous to this, um, at least five or six references that you can click on and go and find a treasure trove of Bible maps, charts, timelines, and such to enhance your Bible study. Now, most of us, when we look at a map, sometimes we look at it and we say, oh, that's, that's interesting. But we don't really, really pay attention to it. But there is nothing like looking at a Bible map to get your orientation right for a study in the scriptures. For example, um, the GPS tells most of us how to get to where we need to go. That is especially important when you are in a new city and you don't have a clue where anything is. And we're always punching in the address or the name of some place so that we can get our bearings and we can find it and get to a particular location. In doing so, the GPS gives us basically a flat line of where we are going. <coughs> But we can look at maps and we can discover exactly where we are but and also the geography or the layout of the land or whether there were mountains or whether it was filled with 
places that might flood, how long it might take someone to travel from point A to point B. We are so used to traveling by car that other modes of transportation uh, may seem foreign to us. We would not dream of walking from Pittsburgh to Washington, D.C., uh, not, not, you know, just one day get up out of the blue and say, oh, we got to go to D.C., we're going to walk. No, we're going to fly, catch a bus, a train, or something, some mode that's going to get us there faster. But in biblical times, they didn't really have all those options, you know. So it behooves us to try to put ourselves in the position of those who were of the ancient times. And what better way to do that than to have a map in front of us? Uh, if we look at the map on page 550 in the Bible, uh, in Ruth, we can see that the Dead Sea is right in the middle of where Moab is on one side, and Jerusalem and Bethlehem and Hebron and Jericho are on the other side. Now, most of us will probably recognize that Hebron, Bethlehem, Jerusalem, and Jericho are cities that the Bible mentions, and they are considered uh, Jewish cities. Okay, but over here on the other side, we see Moab and we see Edom. Moab and Edom. Now, the one thing that we can know about Edom and Moab is that they were not friendly toward the, the, the Israelites. At some points in their history, the Moabites and the Edomites have been um, at war with the Israelites. And we can see how far they had to come to go to this war. But in the context of Ruth, where we are studying it, we can see that at that particular time, Elimelech has chosen to leave Bethlehem and go to Moab. And the most, looking at this, we would think the, the best route for him to go would have probably been uh, across the Dead Sea. But definitely, that wasn't the best route to go. So we would look at it and we would go, we would say, what do we know about the geography of Moab? What do we know about the politics of Moab uh, and the politics of Bethlehem? What do we know about uh, where it's actually located and, and what does it mean to, to travel from Bethlehem to Moab. Now, we can note in Ruth that it doesn't say where exactly in Moab he resided. So it could be like saying he went to the United States. We don't have any clue as to which state he actually resided in. So it could have been anywhere in Moab that Elimelech had chosen to reside and where he, his sons got married and where he and Naomi lived. Okay, so we first want to read what it says about Moab. Now, we still may not understand everything that it says, but it's going to give us uh, an overview. And those things that we don't understand, we can always go further. We can go further. That's the one thing about the Bible. You can always go deeper and deeper into it. Um, so it says, Moab, as a geographic or political entity, is attested as early as the reign of Ramses II, 13th century B.C., who refers to Moab on a pylon at Luxor. Moab consists of three main regions. The northernmost section spans the plains of Moab to the northeast of the Dead Sea. The middle section extends from the plains of Moab southward to the Arnon, A-R-N-O-N, -N, and is generally a fairly level tableland at 2,000 to 2,400 feet elevation. 
Now, the word elevation is important here because the Dead Sea is the lowest uh, elevation that you can get. So we're actually talking about above the level of the Dead Sea. The third and southernmost section is higher with elevations of over 4,000 feet and extending from the Arnon to the Zeret at the southern end of the Dead Sea. Now, we look here and we see on the map, we see the plains of Moab. We see the Arnon River, and we see the Zeret River. So somewhere in between those three sections here, there resided Elimelech. They say, the relationship between Moab and early Israel is difficult to clarify. The Bible notes that Reuben and Gad lived in some of the area later attributed to Moab. And then it tells you to see Numbers 32 and Joshua 13, 15 through 28. Misha, king of Moab in the late 9th century B.C., states that the people of Gad had lived in the area forever. Since the core of Moab seems to have been to the south, the northern regions may have been much more fluid and multicultural in nature. The text gives no indication of where Elimelech settled in Moab. To reach the borders, however, would have taken several days, since the maximum rate of travel on foot would be about 20 miles a day. The distance involved in the move made the decision a serious one, inhibiting easy access to the homeland. If he took the family to northern Moab, he would have traveled northward to Jerusalem and descended to Jericho, where he would have crossed the Jordan into Moab. Now, notice said descended into Jericho. You remember when Jesus was telling the story about the Good Samaritan, and he talks about he descended. That means that uh, where Jerusalem is and where Jericho is is a mountainous range, and Jerusalem is higher than Jericho. So when you descended to Jericho, and that was a dangerous route, because remember, the, 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 the Good Samaritan had to stop and aid somebody who had uh, been, in other words, robbed, beat up, and left on the side of the road, basically, for dead. So, alternatively, he might have traveled southward toward Hebron, descended eastward to the Dead Sea, Cross the sea to Lizen, i.e. the peninsula that extends into the Dead Sea, and climbed into the interior of Moab. This would have been the shortest route to Moab. Um, it may have been the shortest route to Moab, but for me, that would not have been the most likeliest route for him to go. Why? Because the Dead Sea offers no fresh water, no fresh water. So even though it was the short, shortest route, it would offer no fresh water. But, you know, he had two options, and we don't know which one he took, and we can only conjecture. Either way it went, there was some danger involved in the travel. He had to descend down Jericho in a place that we know later to be dangerous, uh, filled with thieves and robbers later in the New Testament. We don't know how it was in the Old Testament, but we do know that that was a dangerous road. And then down this way, he had to cross over the Dead Sea, which is not a place of fresh water. So either way it went. They had it hard. Now, I don't know what type of insight you gain from this, but for me, studying the map and a little bit about Moab begins to tell me a, a lot of things about eliminating. Now, all the Bible really tells us is that he died. 
but we do know that he was in charge of his family, and the famine must have been so bad. It must have been, he must have been so worse off that he decided, I, I need to take my chances. I'm going to take my sons and my wife, and we're going to take our chances elsewhere. Now, that was a daring and bold, courageous decision that he made. Leave everything he knows and go travel, uh, what, some into uh, another country to go and maybe uh, going over mountains or over the Dead Sea or uh, traveling down into the valleys and places of that nature to go and find a place where his family would not only survive, but thrive. And where he himself would die. Now, to me, that puts a different light on things. So we study maps so that we ourselves can better put ourselves in the position of those who are traveling the highways and the byways, about which we know nothing. At least I don't. Now, one of the things that I bought to help me early on was this Bible atlas. It's a Holman Quick Source Bible atlas with charts and biblical reconstructions and as you can see it's quite thick and it has a lot of information in it uh at the time i bought it it was only fourteen dollars and 99 cents and i got it at borders now again i want to say to you that you do not have to go out and buy references you can utilize the references that i've I've given you there as a starting point uh, on Facebook, or you can go to the library and look for a biblical atlas or uh, uh, Bible encyclopedia or even a Bible with a lot of maps in the back of it that you can take a look at. Now, the I'm going to use a um, article written by Greg Gaines called Biblical Maps and Locations, and it was written on February 11th, 2024, and can be found at https colon forward slash forward slash, forward slash biblical definitions, all one word, dot com forward slash Bible hyphen maps forward slash. Again, that's https colon forward slash forward slash biblicaldefinitions.com forward bible dash maps or hyphen maps forward slash. And the reason why I want to refer you to this article is because he does a very good job telling you why you really need to study a map when you are studying the Bible. And he begins, are you looking to gain a deeper understanding of the Bible and its historical context? Look no, no further than biblical maps. And he has on there several interactive biblical maps that offer valuable insights into the geographical layout of biblical lands and help bring the stories of the Bible to life. Now, this is one of the websites that I like to use when I'm going to study Bible maps or when I want to know more about the land because I've not had the privilege of traveling to the Holy Land. Um, maps and interactive maps, especially um, maps showing what the what the landscape looked like are all uh, helpful to me as I study the Bible. He says, whether you're studying biblical geography, exploring the ancient land of the Bible, or seeking a comprehensive Bible atlas, interactive Bible maps, 
They are an indispensable resource. They provide a visual tool to navigate the journeys, locations, and historical backgrounds of biblical times. And, and we must keep in mind, too, that uh, what we see of the world today is not what the world looked like back then. Um, we've had a lot of these countries that have now developed. And uh, the way they lived back then is not the way that they live now. So we want to put ourselves into the time frame as well as the the, the culture and the geography and, and, and whatnot of what is going on in the Bible story that we are reading about. Um, have you ever read some of these books and they give you a great narration, and they tell you exactly, they describe the surroundings so much that you can actually visualize what, where you are or what it looks like. That is the purpose, if you will, of a Bible map, to enable you to visualize, get an imagination historically of what the, the place or look. Uh, the place that you are studying looks like. Now, um, now that I know where Moab is, where uh, Jerusalem is, where Jericho is, where Bethlehem is, I now will not forget that they go like this around the Dead Sea. And I will not forget that in order to get to Moab, you have to go down from Jerusalem to Jericho and then cross over on the plain. And that it's a longer route than just going down to Hebron and crossing over the Dead Sea and getting into Moab that way. So now I have some context. I have some travel time. I can travel 20 miles a day. And it was further than that because they said it would take several days to get there. Okay. So it probably would be like me traveling from Clarksdale to Memphis. It's 72 miles. Uh, and that may be longer or shorter than this distance. But 72 miles. And ordinarily it would take you about two hours to get from Clarksdale to Memphis by car. But what if I was to walk it? That might take 20 miles a day, three, four days to get there. So this is not something that I'm going to take lightly because I got all my belongings that I want to take with me too. And traveling with my luggage or whatever and walking, or even with a backpack or a knapsack, that will get heavy, but 20 miles a day, you know, where am I going to sleep? What type of terrain am I going to be laying in overnight? What type of dangers, toils, and snares are, am, I, am I going to encounter as I go from place to place? My mind begins to think about these things, and that's the whole point, again, of knowing where you are in the Bible. Okay, so Bible maps are a vital resource for Bible study, offering insight into the journeys, locations, and lands of biblical times. Interactive Bible maps provide a visual tool to enhance your understanding of the Bible's geographical content. Accurate and historical Bible maps can be found in in products such as study Bibles, Bible surveys, and Bible atlases. Some of you may have Bible maps at the end of your Bible. Uh, this one has maps uh, in it as well as at the end of the Bible. So some of you may have more maps than others. You may have resources there that can give you a clue. This is where you are. Now, sometimes... The maps are key to a timeline because over time things are destroyed, <laughs> and so and, and and boundaries are moved, and so what's here today may may not be here a hundred years ago, a uh, hundred years later. Let me say. 
So you want to keep in mind that there may be some shifts in the geography as you read across the timeline of the Bible. You know, remember the Bible is covering hundreds of years, okay? Using high-quality Bible maps can significantly enrich your Bible study experience. Explore the ancient Bible, biblical cities and immerse yourself in a world, in the world of Bible with biblical cartography resources. And cartography is a big word that simply means the art of drawing maps or charts. Now, there are different kinds of Bible uh, maps or Bible products, and I've already referred to two. One is the back of your Bible. The second one is to have a study Bible. The third is to have a commentary or look at a biblical survey. Or you can just get a book of maps and charts or a book, uh, a Bible atlas like this one. Whatever you decide to use, it's okay. And you can go as deep as you want to or as shallow as you want to, okay? Sometimes I just glance at the map to look and see what did the land look like because, you know, you know me, uh, I, 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 I walk, but going up hills and mountains and through deserts and things, that's really not my, my forte. And I know how I would feel if I had to approach a journey and they said, you have to cross the desert. And when you cross the desert, you're going to go into this valley. And then you're going to have to climb up this mountain. Chances are, if I'm going to do all of that, I'm not going to be carrying as much stuff as I would have had the land been flat and level. So, you have to put yourself in their shoes. How much stuff could they actually carry from point A to point B? You know, what would be essential? What would they purchase when they got there? Now, a lot of that's going to be your imagination, okay? And it's okay. Um, sometimes you, you, you may say, well, I would have to have X, Y, and Z. If I lived back in that day. Okay. Put it in your pack. And you might say. Well did Elimelech carry this? With his, with his sons. And with his wife. Would it have been. How did they travel there? Were they just on foot? Did they have any type of pack animals. Or what not with them? Did they build some type of. Uh, heart. To carry stuff. And and. How fast would they have gotten there if they had pack animals and a cart and all of that stuff to lug along with them? Now, for me, the most important thing that they could have carried was something they didn't have, which was food and water. They were in the midst of a famine, and they're traveling along this, this journey if you will, from however they decided to go to Moab with very little food or water. Because that's where they came from. We can't forget the context in which we are reading the Bible. If we turn back to uh, Ruth, the first chapter and the first verse, it says, in the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. So a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. The man's name was Elimelech, and his wife's name was Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Milan and Kilion. They were Ephratites from Bethlehem, Judah, and they went to Moab and lived there. Now... You know how sometimes when you're a little kid, you want to carry everything in the world with you because, you know, you can't leave your teddy bear behind because you don't, you don't know if they're going to have. First of all, 
teddy bear is special to you. So you don't want to leave it behind. But what did they leave behind that was special to them in order to go to a new place foreign to them and set up shop and live? Now I'm building a picture in my mind. I'm bringing the Bible to life. And while I don't want to be um, so imaginative that I leave the scopes and confines of the context, I can put myself in their shoes. And now I believe began to read Ruth from a new perspective. I am walking a mile, two miles, 20 miles, 40 miles in their shoes. Now, uh, there are some props. Um, some publications that he recommends here and I'm just going to give them to you and you can utilize them for whatever they are worth. I will comment on one as I've had some dealings with them and that is the, he says the ESV study Bible uh, and the ESV Bible Atlas are highly regarded and are top recommendations from him. Rose Publishing I have bought several things from Rolls Publishing. I like them because most of their maps come um, with some type of covering or vinyl. So if you spill water or something on it, it won't destroy the the resource. And from that, you can actually set it, stand it up, or or put it on um, some type of uh, chart um, or board where you can actually utilize it in a classroom setting. Um, the next thing that he touches on is Bible geography. And he says it plays a crucial role, Bible geography plays a crucial role in understanding the geographical terrain of the ancient world described in the Bible. It provides insights into three-dimensional nature of the land, including valleys, mountains, and other topographical features. By studying Bible geography, we can gain a clearer visualization of how biblical characters might navigate it to terrain and appreciate the significance of locations mentioned in the Bible. One fascinating aspect of Bible geography is the exploration of three-dimensional maps. These maps go beyond traditional flat representations and provide a more immersive understanding of the biblical topography. They enable us to see the land from different angles and perspectives, adding depth and authenticity to our visualization. Um, if you go to some of the Bible, some of the museums, the Smithsonian or the Louvre, and you look at them in 3D and you can turn it around and actually view the exhibit and you can bring it closer or you can uh, take it out of focus. I enjoy doing that in my spare time. Yes, I'm weird. Um, but if you can, if you can uh, do that and you bring things into focus or out of focus, you actually get a better perspective because now you have depth. You not only have flat perspective, you have a depth per perspective. And so you can look at it from a different point of view. Um, for example, if you look at valleys, mountains, and other topographical features, you can get an enhanced visualization of biblical journeys and events. It's one thing to say that they're traveling along the road, but if the road is curvy and going up and down and uh, maybe the road is made of some type of material that's quote unquote not asphalt, 
like we think of it, concrete. Maybe it's it's just a path or a cut through or something of that nature. We begin to get a different picture when we look at what they actually traveled. You can see landscapes and scenic routes, deeper appreciation for the natural beauty and the challenges faced by biblical figures. And you might want to even start to think about, okay, there's a, these are mountains. Why would God, who is the creator of all things, put them in a land that is surrounded by mountains? Was, was that to keep them safe? To keep the enemies out so he could protect them. They could be protected better. Not that he couldn't protect them somewhere else. But that they could be protected better. Have a better vantage point for certain things. We began to try to to understand why God would do what God did in creation. And place them here at this particular time in history. Um. God always has a plan and a purpose, and we should be looking for that plan and purpose as we study the Bible. Uh, we might want to look for uh, water bodies in coastal regions, understand the significance of rivers and lakes, seas, and their role in biblical narratives. Now, uh, uh, my brother did a fascinating Bible study to me. One of the things I like to do when I go to his house is open up his Bible. And he writes down things on little bits, little pieces of paper. And I like to shake the, the little pieces of paper out. And once upon a time, I shook out the little piece of paper and I discovered that he was doing a Bible study on the flowers of the Bible. I said, really? The flowers of the Bible? That's got significance. And that led me to do a Bible study on the mountains of the Bible. Okay? Because it gave me a better insight and an understanding of what was going on on certain mountains. And when I encountered them in different timelines in the story and it gave a different understanding and a purpose. This happened at X Mountain. Uh, this happened at X Mountain. And because I know that this happened, uh, the fire, for example, that Moses saw, uh, the burning bush that was not consumed, he returned to that same mountain later in the story. But had I not done a study of the mountains of the Bible, I would have missed that point altogether. So I am saying to you, uh, valleys, mountains, other topographical features, landscapes, scenic routes, water bodies, and coastal regions all contribute to the story. It's the setting, if you will, of the story. Uh, he goes on to say the geographical context of the Bible adds depth and richness to our understanding of the biblical narrative. It helps us visualize the challenges faced by biblical figures in their journeys, appreciate the natural beauty of the land, and grasp the significance of, of specific locations in biblical events. Bible geography brings the text to life, enabling us to experience the stories in a more tangible way. By exploring the geographical terrain of the ancient world through Bible geography, we can immerse ourselves in the context of the biblical narrative, gaining a deeper understanding of the historical and cultural significance of the scriptures. Now, um, I'm from the South. We do things a certain way in the South. And sometimes it's different than people in other country, in other uh, parts of the United States. Uh, the Eastern Coast or the West Coast or the North, as we call it, have a different 
background cultural history and context in which they live. Um, and so is the same with the Bible. So is the same with the Bible. Okay. I can't emphasize that enough because we must learn to study the Bible in context. And a lot of times we think about context as just being, um, I've got a verse, I've got to make sure I study the chapter of which the verse is found. I've got to make sure I understand the book in which it's written. I've got to understand where it falls in the Old Testament and where it falls in the context of the whole Bible story. That's fine. But when we do, when, when, remember when I did this, the hermeneutical spiral uh, a couple of years ago, and you may not have been online at that particular time, but I talked about context is more than just the chapter, the book, or the Bible itself, or, or which testament it's in. It also deals with the culture, the history, and in this case, maps geography, um, and charts and timelines to add to our knowledge base of who God is. And to me, it also gives um, not only who he is, but I begin to, to get a greater appreciation of his sovereignty and why we worship him, give value, ascribe value to him. Uh, when I think about how God moves us through the creation story, settles us in on the Abrahamic line, and then moves us out into that line and then when it looks like the line may have died off as it does in in the story of Naomi along comes God and provides a Boaz in order to carry on the line with Ruth and then you have David to come along, uh, Obit, first Obit, just David to come along. And then from David, you move forward from David the king. And then you have that long genealogy in uh, Matthew, the 40 and two generations. When you think about the mind of God in this scope of God in, in putting together the storyline of the Bible, we also must wrap that storyline in its location. God could have chosen anywhere in the world that he had created to place the people, but he didn't. He chose a specific space. And that specific space we gain understanding of when we look at maps, charts, timelines, so forth and so on. Um, one of the other things that we want to look at is archaeology. And I really didn't understand the concept of archaeology um, until I heard uh, a professor named Dr. Walters talk about his archaeology trips and he put them together. He show us artifacts and then he would um, talk about where these artifacts were in the context of Paul's journeys. And I started going, archaeology? I mean, I know it exists, but I never even thought about and perhaps it's just me, the role that archaeology could play in the development of my understanding of Bible, 
Now, I know that, you know, how the people lived was vastly different. And we have the ruins in, in certain places where we can go and actually see some of these things. But having not seen them, out of sight, out of mind for me. And knowing that when I'm looking at a map and and looking at, at archaeology and, that, and the crucial role that archaeology plays in creating an accurate biblical map, that lets me know that God in my mind don't think like God's mind. His thoughts have to be higher than my thoughts. His ways have to be higher than my way. Because look at how he has brought all of this together. All of this together. Um, by incorporating archaeological findings, maps offer accurate city locations and validate the historical accuracy of the Bible. Archaeology, archaeological interpretation further enhances our understanding of the biblical narrative. It allows us to associate archaeological site names with their correct biblical names, providing valuable insights into the context and significance of biblical events. The careful analysis of archaeological evidence ensures that Bible maps have a solid foundation rooted in historical and geographical reality. To illustrate, he talks about uh, the archaeological site Beseda, B-E-T-H-S-A-I-D-A, and the correct Bible name is Julius, J-U-L-I-A-S. Then you go and you have the archaeological site of Jericho. Yes, they know where it is. They have found it. They have located it. And so when we read the word Jericho, we know that Jericho was an actual city. It wasn't a uh, made-up place, somebody's fantasy or whatever. It actually existed. The same with Jerusalem, which we can go to today. But it is now modernized archaeology archaeology helps us to 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 see what it was in those times in those times um it allows us to visualize the cities and the landmarks mentioned in the bible and if we know that jericho was real and we're reading about Joshua fought the battle of Jericho. And we know that Jericho is a real place. That gives us more meaning, or at least it does me. And if Jericho is real and Jerusalem is real and Bethlehem is real and uh, historians can tell us about these cities. I can see them on the map. I can go back and look at, you know, the archaeological sites and, and I can understand that it's real. Then that lends some validity to the rest of the story. To the rest of the story. Um... Now, one of the things that I want to talk about is, again, you don't have to go out and purchase all these things. There are boatloads of maps and books and archaeological uh, uh, research that you could do. And you could end up filling your library with nothing but these things. But you don't have to do that. You can still utilize your library or utilize the web to be able to pick up uh, what is actually going on. And with some accuracy, um, you want to uh, look at, you know, how the maps 
change over time. You want to be able to follow a timeline or the chronology in Bible maps. Um, you want to be able to 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 actually utilize these maps to enhance your study. Now, I said all of that to say this. Um, don't forget what you have before you in order to um, gain a clearer understanding of the Bible. Now, sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes a picture is worth a thousand words. You showing a, if you're teaching a Bible study and you're showing uh, a map that has all the terrain marked, what's deserts, what's mountains, what's green, where the water is, and that sort of thing, people immediately, I didn't realize. And that's the whole thing about the Bible. As a teacher of God's word and as a student of God's word, I like those experiences because it opens up my mind and exposes me to a level of the Bible which I otherwise would have just swept over and swept off. Um, when you're preparing um, uh, a story from the Bible to study, teach, preach, whatever you're going to do with it, whatever context you're going to do it in, whether it's individualized or group, and you fail to look at where the story takes place. Many times you have missed the crucial insight to the story itself. Um, one of the things that... Um, I can't emphasize enough is the Bible is not a dead book. Uh, people say that the Bible is boring to read. In what way can you show or tell somebody a story that can enhance how they see it? Enable them to feel it. Enable them to uh, reach out and touch what is going on. One of the most important things that we can do is let people know that the Bible is a living word. And bring it to life for individuals who may think that, I don't need that. That's dead. That's old for me. It allows you to, to, to put, if you will, people in situations and circumstances. And people say, oh, is that what it was like? Really? The next question is, how did they move from point A to point B? How did they get out of that situation? You have piqued their interest. And the whole point of a preached word or a taught word or a studied word is to pique your interest so that you can figure out how it applies to you in your circumstances at this point in your life. And the more you can have a life application for the Bible, the more real it will become to you and the more real the God that you serve and worship will be to you. The more real it will be when you talk about uh, the Jesus suffering and dying. When you talk about the way to the cross 
and you and you can bring it to life. The more you can talk about not only his suffering and his pain, but you can talk about where they laid him, why they laid him where they laid him. Understand the 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 how of what is going on, the historical context, the cultural context. The more uh, meat, I guess, you can put on the table to wrap on the bones, the more you will be able to say to somebody, come and see a man. Come and listen to what he has to say. Come, let God speak to you. Come, and you will be able to paint a picture of who God is in such a way where he is lifted up. And when you say, when and the Bible says, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. Well, that's about the time that we have today. And I pray that you have uh, gathered that it's important to study the maps, the charts, the timelines, the topography, the geography, uh, the cartography of the Bible so that you can bring the Bible to life. So that those who are dead in their sins can be brought into a life-giving, life-sustaining situation. And that they may have the Bible's words breathed on them. In such a way that it gains flesh and that they are able to become a soldier in God's army, a living, breathing, excited soldier in God's army. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for this time that we have spent together. And we thank you, Father God, that you have enabled us to speak with conviction about the role that charts, timelines, and maps can play in helping us to better understand and share your word with others how they can bring it to life, the Bible to life, and even bring life to those who are the walking dead. We thank you, Father God, for these insights. And we pray, Father God, that over the next seven days that we will delve into the Bible in a way that the Bible becomes even more alive to us today than it was on yesterday. In the name of Jesus Christ, we do pray. Amen. Remember, God really does love you, and so do I. Until next week, uh, stay in the Word. And, and God, God really does love Love you. He really does. And so do I.